broad topics of personality and mental health with respect to creative people have, have really interested me, like you said, for over 20 years and have been uh, the subject of many of my sites. I'm going to break down those larger topics into uh, at least these five kind of subtopics. And uh, again, they, they are topics on my variety of websites, including the ones I'm listing here. I just wanted to, to show uh, the listing of sections of my main book, Developing Multiple Talents, the personal side of creative expression. Um, it, this just indicates the range of topics and issues that many researchers and authors address with respect to creative people. There's certainly not time here to go into all of these in any detail, but one of the points I'm trying to make here is that uh, creative people tend to be uh, highly complex. Creativity researcher Mihai Chiksent Mihai. Uh, he's really acclaimed for one of the uh, the pr premier books in the field, Creativity Flow and the Psychology of Discovery and Invention. And he's he's commented: if there's one word that makes creative people different from others, it is the word complexity. He wrote an article titled 10 Paradoxical Traits of the Creative Personality. And writer Juliet Bruce uh, has summarized the main points of his article, which indicate this kind of complexity. A great deal of physical energy with, with great need for quiet and rest. This is a uh, a reference, I think, to the kind of care that introverted and highly sensitive people need. And I'll be going into that a bit more. Highly sexually, often celibate, smart and naive at the same time. This, this is uh, an interesting area. A, a lot of actors I've read and interviewed talk about feeling like they never grew up, that they're just big kids and, and play acting. I think that tr that's also true of many other kinds of, act of, of artists, that there's a, uh, a, an ongoing connection with their child self. He also talks about both convergent and divergent thinking which you may have come across. I'm not going to go into that. Um, he says both extroverted and introverted, needing people in solitude equally. I don't really agree with that. I think, I think uh, a lot of us are introverted and very uh, at home, so to speak, living and working in solitude. Uh, of course, everybody needs people to some extent, but uh, anyway, I'm not sure exactly what he he was he had in mind about them being equal, humble and proud, and both self-doubting and wildly self-confident. It, it's something that shows up with a lot of creative people. I'll go into that more in just a minute here, and then defying gender stereotypes. This is a reference to androgyny, which is also uh, often the case with creative people. This uh, great quote by John Lennon is uh, it really has caught my attention over the years of reading biographies and interviews with many highly talented and creative people. It's, it's often struck me how many of them talk about being self-critical and having poor self-esteem. 
writer Larry Kane commented about his, his bio, quote, Lenin revealed that, quote, people would be surprised at how insecure John Lennon was and his lack of self-esteem. Throughout his life, even during the height of Beatle mania, he had poor self-esteem, even though he exuded confidence. Uh, another example is Nobel Prize laureate and poet and writer Czeslaw Milos. I'm not really pronouncing that very well, I'm sure. But anyway, he confessed, quote, from early on, writing for me has been a way to overcome my real or imagined worthlessness. And Stephanie Tolan, uh, the co-author of the book Guiding the Gifted Child, has found that, quote, many gifted adults seem to know very little about their minds and how they differ from more ordinary minds. The result of this lack of self-knowledge is often low, sometimes crippling, cripplingly low self-esteem. Tilda Swinton is uh, one of my favorite actors. She won an Oscar for her role in Michael Clayton. I thought this was a, a really amusing anecdote she has given about being referred to as Sir in elevators. And, quote, I think people just can't imagine I'd be a woman if I looked like this. But part of her power as an actor and many of her characters is in their androgynous look and energies. And, and she's commented about feeling or, or being really fascinated with the question of how do we identify ourselves and, and how do we settle into other people's expectations for our identity. Androgyny is not just about appearance. Kathleen Noble, PhD, is a professor and psychotherapist who works with many gifted clients. And she said in our interview some years ago, quote, gifted women tend to be highly androgynous. They tend to combine qualities that we ascribe to both genders. That can also apply to men as well. This, this area of, of high sensitivity or sensory processing sensitivity is really relevant for creative people. Psychologist Elaine Aaron is probably the leading uh, expert in the field or in the area and says, she summarizes it as your brain processes information and reflects on it more deeply. Writer Pearl Buck made a, a comment that, that's been widely circulated over the years. Quote, the truly creative mind in any field is no more than this a human creature born abnormally, inhumanly sensitive. While I appreciate some of her, of her perspectives, there are parts I don't really agree with. What does truly creative even mean? And is she implying that only those who are highly sensitive qualify as true creators? Also, she says, inhumanly sensitive as though it were some extreme condition. But research by Dr. Aaron and others indicates the trait occurs in 15 to 20 percent of people, even animals. In an edition of her newsletter, Dr. Aaron addresses Buck's comment. She says, Buck was saying all creative people are highly sensitive. I don't know about that, but I know all 
highly sensitive people are creative by definition. She goes on, many have squashed their creativity because of their low self-esteem. Many more had it squashed for them before they could ever know about it. But we all have it. Creativity coach Lisa Riley has found that many of her clients are highly sensitive and creative. She also notes this characteristic does not discriminate between painter, actor, or musician. They all appear to have one thing in common. They experience the world differently than the average individual. She adds, creatives often feel and perceive more intensely, dramatically, and with a wildly vivid color palette to draw from, which can only be described as looking at the world through a much larger lens. I thought that was a nice poetic expression of it. You may be familiar with uh, actor Jessica Chastain for her acclaim in her movie Zero Dark Thirty, The Help, and other movies. In this quote, she talks about uh, crying easily. I cannot not cry if someone around me is crying. She also has, has commented, I was the girl who cut school to go to the park, and the other kids would be smoking and drinking, and I'd be reading Shakespeare. Her comment here about, quote, weakness or sensitivity probably reflects the kinds of often disparaging attitudes and criticism that many non-sensitive people have about those who are sensitive. But crying is uh, an interesting form of being highly sensitive, or at least being intensely emotional. I've read many interviews with very talented actors and other artists and have been struck by how many of them talk about crying as almost part of their personality. Dr. Aaron even declares that highly sensitive people, quote, do cry more readily than others. It was a strong finding in our research. She has a, a self-test called Are You Highly Sensitive on her website that includes some items that indicate the kinds of intense feelings which can lead us to cry more easily or become cheerful, such as, quote, I am deeply moved by the arts or music. That, of course, can apply to many people, not just highly sensitive people, but I think uh, for highly sensitive people, it, it's, it's, it's more profound and more intense. Another actor who's talked about being sensitive is Winona Ryder. And this, her quote about feeling maybe you're too sensitive for this world is uh, a possible reference to the kinds of emotional or sensory overload and overwhelm that highly sensitive people may experience and need to be aware of and, and take care of. Another example, or, or at least related, is Catherine Bigelow. She's gotten a lot of acclaim for her directing work in Zero Dark Thirty, and along with controversy. But I thought it was interesting that she refers to herself as shy and also 
her star of and her star actor in the Hurt Locker, Jeremy Renner, also reportedly shy as a child, has commented about her being painfully shy. Another woman that uh, I, I really was kind of surprised to, to read about feeling shy is Sigourney Weaver, who was so powerful in the Alien movies and other movies. She once commented, quote, I remember when I met director Ang Lee and we were left alone. I was so shy and he was so shy. Neither of us said anything to each other for about 20 minutes. Finally, we started talking about the ice storm. I'm, I'm bringing in this idea of shyness because I, I, I think it is used by many people when they're really talking about being introverted or highly sensitive, or maybe have all three qualities. But Dr. Aaron notes it has the, the term shy, especially in this country, this culture, has some very negative connotations. She points out it, it doesn't have to. There can be positive ones. But many actors have talked about themselves as being shy. One example is, is Claire Danes. In an interview when she was about 15, she said, quote, I never thought of myself as shy, and then I realized I am kind of shy. I've just built defenses to hide it. I think that's uh, true for many shy people, especially in adolescence, when it's, it's so important for them to, uh, to fit in and be accepted by other teens. Musician Gwen Stefani, according to a British newspaper profile, was a, quote, shy girl who spent most of her time in a bedroom plastered with Marilyn Monroe posters, who nevertheless assumed she was destined for greatness. And I've often been struck by how many apparently very self-assured performers and actors have been shy or introverted as children, and many still are as adults. But again, shyness and introversion, although they may, may seem to be the same, they, they really are not. They, they can overlap and have we may have both traits, but they're not the same thing. Elaine Aaron notes that highly sensitive people prefer to look before entering new situations and, and as a result may be called shy. But she points out shyness is learned, not innate. And it's really, it can be a, at least a, a form of social anxiety if it's too intense. Back to this item by uh, Dr. Csikszentmihalyi, it's the idea of a great deal of physical energy alternating with a great need for rest and quiet. Um, this is really applicable to people with high sensitivity and introversion. This is a, a really provocative and fun quote by actor William H. Macy. Nobody became an actor because he had a good childhood. Dr. Cheryl Errett, a clinical psychologist in Los Angeles specializing in trauma recovery, fertility, and, and creative artist issues agrees 
the Macy's comment is, is both funny and provocative. I've had the privilege of interviewing her several times, and we share a number of interests in how people can better access their creative talents. One of the, of the uh, aspects of creative people, and of course people in general to some extent, that she talks about is uh, the concept of the shadow self that psychologist Carl Jung addresses in therapy and writings. Dr. Eret notes that our emotional health and balance, especially for artists, may depend on having some understanding and acceptance of the darker or less comfortable sides of ourselves. And doing this also gives us more power to make aware choices rather than to just reacting to life unconsciously. She's also commented that actors and other artists who are willing in their creative work to delve into the really, quote, messy feelings of being human, like shame, devastations, disappointments, betrayals, traumas, and other experiences, probably have a relationship with those feelings. And a, a number of actors I've read and, and interviewed express that idea as well, that they are drawn to a role, for example, because there was a strong personal connection with, with the role for them. Joss Whedon is uh, another artist who acknowledges the value of exploring the darker side. But some kinds of darker side, of course, can be destructive. There are many actors and actresses with bad boy or troubled images, with problems over issues like anger and acting out. Christian Bale even has had a nickname Tandy for so often throwing tantrums on locations or on sets. You can probably see at least one of them on YouTube. Another issue is uh, substance use and abuse. Drugs and alcohol are used by many creative people, often to, to deal, uh, often as self-medication. Uh, that's a whole other big topic I'm not really going to get into, but I just wanted to point it out. Colin Farrell, though, uh, has made a nice comment about overcoming his alcoholism and uh, becoming a lot more free to express himself creatively after becoming sober. Dr. Era talks about the fears that many artists have about treating depression, anxiety, or other challenges because they think it might numb or, or lose their creativity. She points out that for certain forms of psychotherapy and techniques such as EMDR can be very effective in helping creative people get past emotional pains which actually interfere with their creativity. They don't fuel it. That's an, another topic is, is the idea of madness and creativity. Uh, what do we mean by, by madness? And 
I'll get into that a little more. But I, I like this quote by Director Tim Burton, who, who notes he's been often called crazy. Some people, journalists, for example, uh, refer to him as crazy or at least eccentric, which may be a polite cover label for mad. But of course, people can have very real mental health and emotional um, challenges. This was a program last year, A Brilliant Sacrifice. It's a really good program with a number of guests, including Dr. Eret in the, in the photo. The program description notes, a new study confirms that certain mental disorders are le linked to creative genius. And this is nothing new. O over perhaps the last hundred years of psychology, there's been indications of that kind of link. One of the guests on that program is Dr. Judith Schlesinger. And she's been uh, very critical of a number of these studies, including the one mentioned in the program, a Swedish study by the Karolinska Institute. She says that it has significant issues in terms of its scientific validity. And these kind of studies just tend to perpetuate the mythology of the mad artist. She's also commented, there's still no concrete empirical proof that highly creative people are any more likely to be mood disordered than any other group. That's uh, a, a, an idea supported by creativity researcher Dean Keith Simonton, who notes, quote, few creative individuals can be considered truly mentally ill. Indeed, outright disorder usually inhibits rather than helps creative expression. Furthermore, he continues, a large proportion of creators ex exhibit no symptoms, at least not to any measurable degree. But many artists have bought into that mythology of, of madness as a fuel for creativity. One of the dangers of it, of the mythology, is we may consider ourselves, quote, not crazy enough to be creative, or that our mental health challenges, such as anxiety and depression, should be endured in order to, quote, protect our creative power. Musician Sting really addressed that head on. He said, and admits he bought into the myth for a long time. In addition to this quote, he says, I tried that for a while, and to a certain extent, that was successful. I was the king of pain, after all. I only know that people who are getting into this archetype of the tortured poet end up really torturing themselves to death. Another well-known example is painter Edvard Munch, who created the famous painting, The Scream. He once commented, quote, I want to keep my sufferings. They are part of me and my art. 
referring to his statement, psychologist Kay Redfield Jameson notes in her book, Touched with Fire, Manic Depressive Illness and the Artistic Temperament. Quote, this is a common concern. Many artists and writers believe that turmoil, suffering, and extremes in emotional experience are integral not only to the human condition, but to their abilities at our, as artists. Another issue here is misdiagnosis. Dr. James Webb notes that many psychiatrists, pediatricians, and other healthcare professionals may not be sufficiently educated about the traits of giftedness and consider some of these traits to be pathology. He says further, these common misdiagnoses stem from an ignorance among professionals about specific social and emotional characteristics of gifted children, which are often then mistakenly assumed by these professionals to be signs of pathology. So it's, it's important to be informed about giftedness characteristics if you are a creative person, whether or not you think you're gifted. Moving on to the topic of anxiety, this often shows up as writer's block or other issues. This is a, a photo from one of my favorite movies, Adaptation. Nicolas Cage is playing screenwriter Charlie Kaufman. The movie Adaptation was written by the real Charlie Kaufman. It's, it's a, a really good movie about the creative mind and the challenges of having a creative mind. Dr. Maisel notes that anxiety can really silence many creative people. He notes there are many different kinds of anxiety reactions, <coughs> excuse me, including confusion, uh, quote, weakness of mind and body, persistent worry, and procrastination. He also makes an interesting comment, quote, but one of the most common anxiety reactions is a phobic reaction. Many cases of creative blockage, perhaps most, are phobic reactions to the creative encounter. These are real, painful, persistent phobias that affect many creative people and help us understand why creative people are prone to addictions. One of his books uh, talks further about this, titled Mastering Creative Anxiety. Trauma and creative people is another very large topic. Um, we all may experience some kind of trauma in life, but how do creative people deal with trauma and use it in their creative work? 
uh, just an aside here, it, trauma is not just a major event like um, surviving a car crash or a tsunami or a rape or being in a war. There are many, quote, small t traumas that psychologists talk about that often occur in, in childhood abuse of various forms. I first really got interested in the whole topic doing an interview with um, psychologist Stephen A. Diamond. He writes about a number of prominent and accomplished artists who express their demons, their inner and outer conflicts in positive ways. One example he gave was French sculptor, painter, and filmmaker Nikki de saint -Val. He noted her famous shooting paintings resulted from firing live ammunition at paint-filled balloons mounted on canvas. Dr. Diamond commented that, quote, rather than becoming a crazed killer or a vengeful victimizer of men, the sun falls fury, some of which stemmed from having been sexually abused by her father, fostered a fecund creativity that served her well throughout her prolific career. He also talks about how this kind of rage for actors and performers and other artists when channeled into their work gives it an intensity and passion that they seek. This statement by actor Halle Berry, I think, is, is a really key idea about trauma. I think I've spent my adult life dealing with the sense of low self-esteem. That's sort of implanted in me. Trauma can really have that kind of deep and ongoing impact. She commented, <coughs> excuse me, she commented about acting in her intense movie Gothica in 2003, quote, although physically I would feel exhausted and tired, my back would hurt, my arms would hurt, and my feet would be raw from running through all the stuff. There was still something about it that felt good, like I had a cathartic experience. I got a lot of stuff out of me that was penned up in little corners of myself. So I felt good at the same time. A number of, of other artists make those kinds of comments. You may have heard about artist Sark, who notes she's a survivor of incest and has talked in her many books about the, the really destructive outcomes of that trauma on her life. She says, from the ages of 14 to 26, I had 250 different jobs because I was trying to figure out what I was supposed to do with my life. At 26, I finally turned to dedicate myself to art and writing and proceeded for the next 10 years to be rejected in every way that you could be. She says she knows art is healing because of how it heals me. And I, I see it healing other people every day. She adds, through art, we come alive through the deep connections to our souls and spirits.
the late actor Charles Durning made this, had had traumatic experiences in the war, including killing a young German soldier, and made this really nice comment about creative work. There are many secrets in us, horrifying things we keep secret. A lot of that is released through acting. Another example is Rooney Mara, so acclaimed for the girl with the dragon tattoo. I had a lot of anxiety growing up because I was so shy. I think that's part of the reason I like acting. I, I can be somebody else. Dr. Cheryl Era comments about artists working with all of these kinds of challenging emotions while staying sta psychologically safe. She says, quote, this sensitivity and the ability to go there to create wherever there may be is a gift and a talent. But getting stuck there is no fun for anyone, and it's not required in order to do, to do good work. If you can take good care of yourself and then visit there, everybody wins. The beginning title slide had a, another photo of, of Vigo Mortensen. He's a, a, multi, a, a polymath, somebody who's creatively accomplished in, in many different areas. And he made this really nice comment I, I'm ending up with. Photography, painting, or poetry, are, those are just extensions of me, how I perceive things. Their way, my way of communicating. He also made. A, he also quoted writer Robert Louis Stevenson, who said, "Who Mortensen said made a comment about meandering through a career or the arts in general, without seeming to have a deliberate plan." Stevenson said, quote, to travel hopefully is better than to arrive, and the true success is in the labor. Mortensen adds, that's a great line, to travel hopefully. That's what I'd like to do. Well, thank you very much. I think I'll stop there for any questions that may have come in. Thank you very much, Douglas. We really appreciate you putting this together for us. Um, on the right-hand side of your webinar, there sure. is a control, um, panel where you guys can um, type in some questions and we will be answering them. The first question is, are there any studies or statistics that measure or discuss mental health sensitivities and the creative mind personality. I'm highly sensitive and creative and tend to take things personally, think about them for a long time and have difficulty letting go of past hurts and losses. Is this normal for a creative personality? Um, first of all, yes, I, I think, well, normal is a, is a tricky word. Um, First of all, let, let me just bring up this last slide that I forgot to do before. You can find notes with multiple links to articles on my main site, and maybe Ashley could post the link I gave. If, if you can see the, the main link in, in the uh, sidebar for the presentation, or if you don't see that, just go to my, my site talentdevelop.com slash cpw for 
Creative People webinar. And, and I have been researching these, these ideas of mental health, high sensitivity, creative people for uh, really 20 years. So uh, I can't refer you to just a single article to address your question, but there are multiple articles on my various sites. One of my sites is, for example, is the Creative Mind column on Psych Central. On, on this uh, page of links for this webinar, I'm sure there are at least one links to that column. But you know, let me let me just say something more about normal. Uh, it's kind of back to the idea of misdiagnosis. Um, Dr. Maisel, for example, has talked about creative artists being obsessive um, in order to do effective good work as an artist, you have to be, to some extent, obsessive about your work. He's even commented about an artist, you know, waking up in the morning and thinking about what their project is, and, and that's all their, their consciousness is about for the whole day, is, is their creative work. Well, some uh, uninformed healthcare providers might look at that and say, oh, well, this person has OCD. But, you know, it, it isn't. It's just uh, an aspect of being a creative person. And, and, I'm, and the same thing applies to fears and um, overreactions uh, and high sensitivity. So it's not that, that people cannot experience a destructive form of depression or anxiety. It's just that for creative people, depression, for example, may be just kind of part of their, quote, normal experience. No, I'll leave it at that. I'm, I hope that's some answer. Thank you. The next question is, I'm intrigued by the idea of being highly sensitive. Do many of the artists you've spoken with also have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, depression, chronic anxiety, or are they simply and complexly highly sensitive? Many of the, uh, the actors, writers, directors I've interviewed refer to being highly sensitive in ways. Uh, like I noted, many of them talk about being shy, but it, it seems to me they're really talking about being introverted or highly sensitive or both at the same time. People that I've interviewed directly have not really talked about um, mental health challenges like depression and anxiety. It, it wasn't really an, uh, particularly an, an appropriate topic in the context of our interview. But yes, many interviews with artists I've read uh, talk about that. I've, I've mentioned a few of them in this presentation. Um, like Claire Danes comes to mind. Uh, she's also talked about being depressed. Um, Mandy Moore is another one that comes to mind, has talked about being depressed as a child. So, yes, there are many uh, creative performers and other artists who do uh, 
who are aware of being depressed at some point in their life or of having anxiety to some degree and also of being highly sensitive. I think it's, it's important to note those are not um, mutually uh, interactive. I mean, just because you're highly sensitive doesn't mean you're, you're necessarily going but in in my research I've found that uh, in fact many highly sensitive people and the research indicates that my, many high, highly sensitive people are more vulnerable to overwhelm anxiety and perhaps depression Okay. Thank you. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The next question is, I have spent my adult life putting people off by projecting a cold personality to avoid small talk, which might reveal or touch upon my bipolar diagnosis. I avoid risk with creative expression too, by switching from one type of art to another when I reach a point where I might go public or have success. Is there a common pattern for artists? Or is this a common pattern for artists? Well, I, I don't know that I could say it's a common pattern. I think everybody has their own uh, sense of a boundary about being public versus private. But um, one thing that, that has struck me about a number of performers and other artists, in fact, is their willingness to be public, um, to, to, quote, admit to being um, anxious or depressed or even highly sensitive. It, and highly sensitive is, is a, a topic of real interest to me because I am highly sensitive. And also because this um, Western culture in general, especially the United States, is so oriented towards extroversion and extroverted people and uh, really highly active driven people. Um, Susan Cain has written about this in her book, Quiet. And Dr. Aaron notes that the, her book is really about introversion as much as uh, as high sensitivity. But anyway, I, I think um, one of the recommendations that many artists give about being more uh, completely fulfilled and dynamic as an actor or writer, painter, musician, whatever, is to be willing to put yourself out there publicly as much as you can. Um, one person that comes to mind is Lady Gaga. She's talked about this in um, in various ways and and is not alone. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, J.K. Rowling has talked about the same thing. Just uh, being willing to kind of live with the the um, the anxiety of becoming more known for who you really are is is a powerful way to be more creative. Okay. Okay. I have, um, in your conversation with highly sensitive artists, have they expressed what kind of support they need in order to thrive? I ask because I live and work with an artist and he is both self-doubting and widely self-confident as you described. Sometimes I don't know which aspect of his personality to feed or support. 
That's a, a great question. I think, uh, first of all, everybody needs support. I mean, it's, it's not just artists, but artists, creative people in general, are more vulnerable. And, and this, this idea of self-doubt is, uh, I think, a key characteristic of so many creative people. Um, what comes to mind is the, is the, um, the old uh, endeavor in this country, in the school system especially, no child left behind, I think it was, that talked about you know, improving the, quote, self-esteem of kids. That, that we can't uh, let any kid uh, feel that, that there's something wrong or bad or deficient about them, blah, blah, blah. Well, it had, you know, th there was a good impetus to do that. but. Uh, trying to build up somebody's self-esteem, and I think this applies to building up or addressing somebody's self-doubt, is, is not a matter of unrealistically paying them compliments or, or um, saying something like, oh, you know, you'll get over it, or uh, oh, you know, you're you're really talented. You shouldn't worry about that. Or no, your work it really is good. You shouldn't you shouldn't be doubting it. Well, you know that that's one form of support, and it can work. But I think it, it's much more powerful to really address what they're thinking. When somebody's feeling self-doubt, what what are they thinking about their painting or their their novel or music composition, whatever the case is? If if you can get them to to say really um, specifically what they're thinking that leads them to feel such self-doubt, then you can start to really uh, address their thinking, not just the uh, the feeling that comes out of that thinking. This is a, by the way, a, a very well documented and successful strategy for cognitive therapy, and and really helps people deal with depression and other issues. Okay. Thank leave it you. at that. I'm wondering about your definition of creativity. Aren't organic chemists and engineers, nurses, etc., creative people? Are there different kinds of creativity? Oh, absolutely. My focus in this presentation and in my uh, sites and writings overall is with uh, people working in the arts writers, actors, directors, filmmakers, uh, painters, and so on. But absolutely it's true that uh, science and medicine, uh, politics, education, uh, being an entrepreneur, all of those <laughs> involve creativity, or, or at least should. Um, Developing a a new treatment for you know HIV by a, a bio, biochemist can involve a great deal of, of creativity, and I th I think a lot of what I've talked about in the course of this presentation can apply to scientists and other creative people as well. Uh, this question, are, are we as creative people destined to be misperceived as grandiose thinking people who must ultimately face the consequence of that mis misperception? <laughs> yeah, grandiose people. 
Um, I, yes, I think so. For for many, um, I, I'm a little reluctant to try to you know categorize the world of people into creative versus non-creative. I think all people are creative if they're willing to to access their creative uh, abilities. But if we're talking about people who really choose to be creative in, in very concrete ways, uh, they, they probably will be uh, susceptible to misunderstanding and, and criticism, uh, judgments by other people. And one, one thing that comes to mind is, is uh, writer and coach uh, Tama J. Keeves, she, her new book is called In Inspired and Unstoppable, and it's uh, a really wonderful work. Um, she, w she was a, a very, very accomplished attorney in a law firm, and was, uh, she said, just spiritually dying because it wasn't what she really wanted to do, and finally she decided to uh, to break away from it in order to write her first book. Um, I believe it was called "This Time I Dance." Anyway, one of the one of the uh, comments she got from her mother, which she relates, is she, she quotes her mother in a, a Brooklyn Jewish accent. Something like, you want to write? You're going to starve you want to write. <laughs> um, so that kind of uh, reaction is, is something that many creative people do get. Thank you. Uh, this next one is a comment. I have bipolar one and I'm an award-winning author. I found a way to make writing and bipolar work. I use a wellness recovery action plan to track my emotional moods and triggers. Bipolar has helped me carve out a career as an author. I consider it a gift. It's who I am in total being. I give bipolar credit for my creativity. Even on medication for GAD, social anxiety disorder, OCD, and BP, I manage my life to keep me stable. I wanted to let you know that I understand my sensitivity and gifts and use my mood changes from mania to depression to keep me writing in one way or another. Thank you for this presentation. It was great to see that I'm not alone or weird. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> That's a great comment and applicable to, to many artists. Uh, the next question is, is creativity the result of an environmental circumstance or is it an innate character trait? I, I think it's, it's much more innate. Um, my sense is that most creative people really feel uh, an urgency to create regardless of uh, their environment. Um, But, but obviously environment plays into it. I'm, I'm just, uh, for some reason, thinking of uh, a number of, of people were inter interred, interned in uh, Japanese internment camps during World War II, just taken out of their normal lives and put in prison camps by the U.S. government. One of the, the things that, that happened there is that many people who had never been uh, creative started producing uh, small statues. Uh, they started writing. They, they put on plays uh, and so on. It, it was. Uh, it's really a nice example of people who make the best of their uh, situation, so to speak, by using creative expression. But um, 
the, the interviews I've read with actors, especially, uh, make me think that it's real creativity is really much more uh, an innate pressure. Uh, a number of actors talk about putting on plays when they were, you know, three or four years old. There was just something they had to do. Thank you. We have uh, time for two more questions. Is being highly sensitive considered a mental illness? Definitely not. It's it's a personality trait. Uh, Dr. Elaine Aaron uh, addresses that idea in a lot of her books, and and well, her her main book is the highly sensitive person, which I highly recommend. Um, there are also uh, several Facebook groups and pages devoted to high sensitivity. Uh, my site. Highly sensitive also has a lot of material related to to the, that question, and and the answer is no. It, it's a personality trait. The problem is uh, the the way the trait shows up as um, well. For example, extreme uh, reactivity, uh, an exaggerated startle response. That indicates to some mental health people that, that, that there is a, a quote issue with the person if they react too, too quickly and strongly to an unexpected uh, stimulus. But there's, anyway, there's a lot, lot more uh, to cover about that. But not right now. <laughs> and we have one more, one final question. Um, would a change in a person's life circumstances result in him or her to no longer be creative? Uh, sure. If you get put, uh, put in jail, it, it's going to be hard for you to paint, I would imagine. Or uh, at the, the beginning, I think I referred to uh, a comment by Dr. Aaron about many people having their creativity squashed for them. This, this also refers to the idea of trauma. Um, Halle Berry was uh, regularly abused as a child and that kind of uh, abuse is unfortunately all too common uh, and, and it, it can affect how someone Thinks about themselves, their their quality and level of self-esteem, and therefore how um, how much energy they're going to have to be creative. Thank you, and that is all of the time we have for questions. So if you guys have more, we were not able to get it to you please um, email us or we can be reached through our website, which is internationalbipolarfoundation.org. Thank you so much, Douglas. We really appreciated it. Oh, you're welcome and thank you. Bye-bye.